uh, three presentations. Uh, the first one named How to Communicate the Multiple Benefits of Electric Vehicle Results from a Control Experiment would be done by um, uh, okay. sorry, would be done by James Carroll. James is an energy economist at Trinity College Dublin. His research explores household energy related investment and behaviors, the role of monetary, economic and behavioral drivers, and the effect of informational interventions, such as energy labels and smart meters. Additional research explores household willingness to pay for carbon reduction on flights, and the factor which affects sustainable transport choices. James, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. You can hear me? Yep. Great. We can hear you. OK. Um, let me know if you can't see my screen or can't hear me, but I think everything should be fine. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, Hello from Dublin, Ireland. Um, I, I really wish I was in Paris, but uh, that's the way it goes. Um, I'm chatting today about um, an experiment we did. Uh, when was it? It was last year, um, which looked at the the looked at electric vehicle uh, switching choices, switching from non-electric to electric, in a hypothetical stated preference um, uh, setting. So the project, this research is being funded by the Irish Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland. So it's a three year project called Green Car, which is that little symbol down the bottom right. And we're also partnered with Hyundai Ireland. Um, so the, what, you're, what I'm presenting today is the first phase of the project, which is a, a kind of an online hypothetical setting. But uh, at the moment, we're rolling out a national field trial, which is uh, bringing lots of information into the showrooms uh, of, of, of some high-end dealers to see if it uh, affects, this, affects that EV switch decision. Um, so, yeah, the, what it was, green car. So the project, like I said, uh, we're looking at barriers and enablers of EV adoption, uh, very much in, in Ireland. We're not, we're not really looking uh, doing any experiments outside of Ireland. Uh, it's, it's a policy orientated project. Uh, so we really kind of need to, to get to the point and, and really try and find some, some policy usable results. Um, the core hypothesis that we're working on is that there is, there is imperfect information regarding the, uh, the fuel cost and CO2 implications of the EV switch. And today I'm presenting results from our third work package, which is this consumer survey and car choice experiment. Uh, at the very end, if I have time, I'll, I'll just let you know what we're doing in terms of uh, the, the field trial with, with Hyundai. So why the mass switch to EVs? It seems to be well underway across Europe. Uh, each year seems to beat uh, last year's sales uh, records. Even during COVID, um, EV sales were extremely strong, which is, which is uh, very interesting to see, and, and it'll be very interesting to see what 2021 brings as well. Uh, the, the switch to EV isn't, isn't all good. Uh, there are issues. Um, obviously, they're, they're more expensive cars. Um, you know, it depends what you're comparing, but probably looking at around about 20-30% more expensive, depending on, on the grant situation of your country. Uh, unquestionably, at the moment, um, and maybe this is just because we're at the, the early stage of production, um, the, there's uncertainly a higher upstream carbon uh, emissions from manufacturing. Um, another issue with EVs is what to do with the batteries at the end of life. Um, now, this situation is improving. Uh, batteries are, being, are finding second lives, and they are uh, starting to be recycled. But recycling a lithium-ion battery has always been a challenging thing. Uh, but hopefully that situation improves. Um, benefits are, uh, as we all know, are the, um, the, I guess, very large carbon reductions, depending on the electricity uh, or the, the carbon intensity of our electricity. Ireland, for example, has uh, last year we were 42% wind, uh, which was a record year for Ireland. So uh, 20 years ago, there was no benefit of switching to EV if they existed, but uh, we, are, we are really rolling out uh, wind in Ireland and we're going to be up to 70, 80% uh, by 2030. And um, also based on night rates, if you plug up, if you charge your car using nighttime electricity, you're, you're probably looking at a 70% running cost reduction compared to a equivalent petrol or diesel car. 
Um, I guess uh, you guys are all aware of this, but obviously one of the big benefits, particularly for a country like Ireland, that's going to be relying very much on intermittent wind over the next decade, is uh, once once a, once a household has an EV, it's it's by far uh, its largest consuming, um, I guess, appliance in in the house. So uh, and also uh, the really interesting thing is is that you you know there there is flexibility in charging. So for the average mileage in Ireland, which is about seventeen thousand kilometers and take a large battery EV, um, you know, in reality, you only need to charge once, maybe twice a week. And that means there's tremendous flexibility to align your charging with the needs of the grid, as in charge on, on windy days, uh, for example. Um, so the Irish situation and the European situation, so, you know, net zero CO2 by 2050. Uh, in Ireland, we're, we're part of our, our strategy is uh, to get uh, at 1 million electric vehicles on the road by 2030. We have a long, long way to go. And that's one of the reasons why this project was funded. Uh, so far in Ireland, this, well, up to the end of 2020, there was just 15,000 uh, EVs on Irish roads. Um, but the growth is, is increasing. Uh, the, the annual growth is, 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 is increasing year on year, which is uh, extremely positive. We have a lot of supports in Ireland. We have 5,000 euro grants. We have uh, vehicle registration tax exemptions. Also, BIK is benefit in kind. So, um, it's a, if you're an employer, if you're if, if you're if your employee has uh, you know given you a car to use, uh, you don't have to pay any of those um, the, the taxes on on using that car. Uh, tolls are cheaper, and we also have grants for for home charging. So, uh, what does this experiment do? Um, so we are looking at the in a, we are looking at EV switches in a hypothetical setting, um, and we're, we're it's basically a framing experiment. So we're we're, we're taking fu fuel efficiency and converting it into different uh, different metrics and seeing how those different frames affect that that choice. So what do we already know about this uh, situation in Ireland? Not so much actually, uh, and that's something that this project is really trying to to to, to sort out. Um, we know internationally that there is quite a low, low level of awareness of fuel efficiency that, you know, households generally don't keep track of their fuel expenditure. It's not a major attribute when they're, when they're investing in new cars. So most of this, this research comes from the United States. Um, in terms of the types of information that we give car buyers at the point of sale, uh, there's a bit of research. Uh, we, the current labels in Europe, um, or the current labels in, in Ireland, the, the, the car labels aren't like appliance labels, they differ by country, but um, we don't really know how well the current labeling system is working, uh, to be honest. Um, we do know that there is low levels of trust in manufacturing information, and I guess this, a lot of this has is, is, is come off the back of um, major scandals in the, in the sector over the last decade. Um, you know, consumers generally don't trust the information that's being provided them in relation to cars. Um, and there's been, lastly, there's been a couple of studies that frame uh, fuel efficiency or energy efficiency of cars in monetary terms, uh, showing and showing that that leads to higher demand for, for, for EVs and fuel efficiency. So that's really our, our point of departure is that, that last point there. And that's what we're going to do in this experiment. So very quickly, um, how do we think about, how do we consider this household um, EV switch decision? Well, a household should switch to EV if the costs, if the benefits outweigh the costs. Um, and what does that mean in this context? So on the left-hand side, we have the uh, investment cost difference between C1. One indicates the, uh, the high efficient car or the EV, and C0 represents the uh, low efficient, or let's say your, your old internal combustion, inter internal combustion engine car. So obviously the EV is gonna cost more, so you're gonna have a positive figure on the left. And then on the right, we can uh, we can we work out the discounted uh, energy savings. So there's going to be a, an energy efficiency um, saving here. So it's going to use less fuel or less energy, and um, just multiply that by the fuel price and the mileage per year. And maybe we we look at that over ten years and use a discount rate. And if if these benefits outweigh the costs, then probably we should uh, switch to EV. Now we know this actually isn't uh, how um, households make decisions. But uh, and it's not even how economists make decisions, but uh, it's probably a lot more complicated. So the switch to EV uh, has many different new attributes uh, that we must, must much consider. So in terms of the costs on the left-hand side, we now have you know, a, a change in fueling time. So we used to go from 10 minutes at the petrol station to um, potentially a lot longer. 
although that's that's improving. We now have ultra fast chargers, which are which are helping reduce that speed. We have a, a, a decline in driving range, and that's obviously a big factor. It's one of the main things that's reported on in terms of EVs. And we have um, uncertainty. I, wanna, I won't say that the depreciation rate of EVs has been higher. Uh, for example, the, the Tesla Model 3 has one of the lowest rates of depreciation uh, out there. Um, but there's, there's probably uncertainty in relation to depreciation and battery degradation. We also have a new list of, um, of benefits for the EV driver. So uncertainly or unquestionably, there's a, there's a performance boost. So anyone who's driven or been in an EV knows that it's a very smooth car to run. So you've got potentially, some people are saying they're more comfortable, it's a higher performance, and it's unquestionably a carbon reduction for the household. And that is something that households care about. So that's something we're looking very carefully at on, 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 on different studies um, in, in here in Dublin, that the carbon variable, how much a household cares about carbon uh, climate change is one of the key determinants of these decisions uh, we find across the board. Now, what are we looking at in this project? Well, we're really looking at imperfect information and uh, in relation to these kind of fuel cost savings and also the, the carbon savings. And also, um, you know, a household, it's, you know, to, 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 to work out, to, to calculate these energy savings uh, differences between the drivetrains is not straightforward. So there is a, certainly a transaction cost in terms of, um, you know, accessing this information, uh, working out how to, to calculate these differences and um, you know it takes time it takes effort and mistakes are are being made normally when you provide households with a few bits of key information and ask them to work out the cost differences of let's say uh, a low and a high efficiency fridge uh, they're not very good at it uh, so what we're going to do is just go straight to the point and provide this information to them at the point of sale so we have a couple of hypotheses uh, first one is just that providing comparative energy cost information at the point of sale will increase the demand for uh, electric vehicles uh, we're also going to look at how that information is framed over time. So studies on appliances, um, is, there's a paper by Heinzler in 2012, shows that when you frame energy cost differences over longer periods, as in, for example, 10 years compared to one year, one month, um, it, it seems to have a, a higher uh, effect in terms of getting people to, to, to switch to that more efficient technology. We're also going to do the same for, uh, for carbon as well. Um, you know, carbon is becoming... Uh, an important variable for households uh, in, in, in Europe. And uh, we're also gonna frame that over longer periods as well. Um, and this will make this will be clear in a couple of slides. Uh, finally, we're gonna look at interactions between the two. And um, what we found in other research is that, uh, that there is a positive interaction between um, carbon information and cost information. Uh, they tend to work well together. It's, an, it's, it's almost like a two-step process. This in general, households will, would like to pick the lower carbon technology, but when you back that up with uh, the, the, the energy savings, there, there tends to be a, a really nice uh, interaction between the two. So that's, that's a very important part of our research. So the methodology is a discrete choice experiment. Um, like I said, the next step is to, to run a field trial with, with Ion Ireland, and that's, that's actually on, already underway. Uh, a discrete choice experiment, if no one has seen one before, getting more popular, but um, it's a hypothetical stated preference uh, technique. So often used to value new products or the valuation of public goods, uh, non-market goods, for example. Um, so it can serve as a nice benchmark for experimental analysis, which is what we do here. So we set up a, a benchmark car choice scenario. And then we use that benchmark to, 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 uh, to randomize different informational frames and see how it affects the, the, the car choice. The steps involved are to take the product, so the car, and break it down into the attributes. So an at a car has many attributes, including size and acceleration, for example. And then the researcher needs to define these attribute levels and bounds. And then we randomize all these different attributes and levels into choice sets give them to households to choose different uh, products and, and we look at those choices and, and see what really matters in their choice. The benefits of doing a, a discrete hypothetical experiment is that you have complete control of the situation. So it's, it's essentially a lab technique. It's very low cost. Uh, surveying is, is getting cheaper all the time. Uh, the negatives are obviously this is a hypothetical decision. Um, now we, we think that uh, in our context, while you know hypo hypothetical bias is always an issue, it might be less of an issue for, for us, given that we take a, a benchmark car choice and we, we randomize uh, one piece of information uh, on that benchmark. 
So what we're doing in this experiment is what's known as a pivot design. And I'll show you what that means in the next slide. And we also have eight experimental groups. So we have a, a simple benchmark and then we randomize and change one thing, which is how we present uh, fuel efficiency. So for the, the survey respondents, uh, their first step was to, was to choose um, their preferred car. So this was our attempt really to try and uh, reduce hypothetical bias, to really try and get, uh, get, get, get our respondents in the car buying zone. Um, also, all these, all our respondents had either bought a car in the last five years or intend to buy in, in, in the next five. And um, so first step was to pick their car. So uh, you, we've got a range of different car sizes, different prices. And uh, we also asked them to choose their color and whether they wanted the car to be petrol, diesel or a standard hybrid. So these questions were really just put in to try and get some, some, some respondent buy-in into the process. And then we took their preferred car option and we, we created two EVs uh, beside it. So that was their original car choice. And then what we did is we uh, presented them with two alternative EVs, which were identical in terms of how the car looked and color, and for example. But the, uh, the changes once we switched to the EV, which is these two columns here, uh, was that the EV was either the same price or more expensive. Uh, there was a reduction in boot size, um, there was a big reduction in carbon emissions, and then we added in two new attributes, which is the battery range and whether the, the, the car could be charged using this, this new ultra rapid um, uh, charging technique or not. So then what happens is what the, within the discrete choice experiment is we obviously randomize all these different attribute levels. So um, there was at the end of the day, you have hundreds of different uh, electric vehicle uh, choices for, for um, based on the, the, the respondents benchmark. But the key part of our research is how we framed energy uh, fuel efficiency, the carbon emissions. So we presented that in, in a number of different uh, ways, which I'm gonna show you uh, in the next slide. So our control group received uh, just uh, carbon per kilometer, and this is how um, this is how the WLTP is, is is generally shown in car brochures. So you have CO2 per per kilometer. That's our control group. Uh, the the first three treatment groups added in an energy cost component. So treatment one added in. So we for these first two treatments, we didn't change the carbon framing at all, but we changed the energy cost on the right hand side. So uh, the first treatment had uh, euro per kilometer. The second had euro per year based on 16,000 kilometers. Third had euro uh, over 10 years. So a 10 year fuel cost forecast for the, for, the, for the household. Then we started adding in some carbon frames. So in, from, from, for treatment four and five, we maintained treatment three uh, energy costs. We stayed at 10 year, but then we switched uh, to over to different carbon frames. So we looked at CO2 um, over 10 years in terms of tons. And then we did the same thing, but switched tons to kilograms. Uh, we had, a, we had a, a, an external uh, uh, reviewer who suggested that really that it's, it's just people are responding to bigger numbers. So we wanted to test that uh, to see, you know, if we, if we turn tons into kilograms and the households are presented with, rather than, you know, 10 tons are presented with, you know, uh, into the millions, it can, it can see how that kind of affects, uh, or thousands see how that affects choices. Then finally, we, we looked at uh, framing. Uh, this was kind of a special case treatment where we looked at uh, framing energy costs in terms of months. Uh, the month is an important um, measure of time in terms of car choice. People tend to uh, repay on a monthly basis. So we framed energy costs in terms of months and kept carbon as it is in the, uh, currently in Ireland. And uh, finally, as another kind of a special case fund treatment, uh, similar to treatment five, we converted the uh, carbon into the equivalent number of washing machine cycles per year, which is, as you imagine, uh, pretty, pretty high. So this is a summary of what we did. So first off, we have a baseline car choice. Uh, the respondents were randomized into each of these different uh, energy efficiency frames, a control group plus seven treatments. Uh, there's a block randomization, which is in a DCE. So there's two versions of the DCE. And then each respondent had eight different uh, E, uh, choice cards. So eight times that they were asked to switch from their first choice to the electric vehicle. Um, and we had 200 respondents in each of these uh, treatment groups. So 2000 respondents in total, which is a, a sizable sample. 
Um, so sampling strategy, so we did this online. Uh, like I mentioned, we have 2000 respondents. The only quota we had was age. Um, amazingly, that we don't really know that much about new car buyers in terms of uh, what they look like, and uh, uh, certainly not in Ireland anyway. But the best stat we could find was from the UK. Um, so we found the, 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 I guess the, the age groupings of new car buyers in the, in the United Kingdom. And we used that as our sampling quota uh, for, for this study. Um, also we had one screening, which was that, they, that the, the individual had bought a car, new car in the past 10 years, or they intended, they strongly intended to, to buy a car in the next five. We had a couple of sampling issues. Uh, we missed the older age group, and this is a common problem for anyone doing online surveys. Uh, but our solution to that was just to reweight the, 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 the data um, up to the, the quotas that we, we set at the start. Other than that, the sample looks really good. Um, the, you know, the household income is bang on. We are slightly over overeducated, um, but we've tested the robustness of the results by all these different, um, uh, I guess, missed quotas. And they, they really don't have any effects on, on the results. Um, so just to the first set of key results, I'm just going to check my time. Um, so first off, what I'm showing you here is the switch rates to EVs. So the, the, this is, this is, we're looking at the probability of switching from your baseline uh, internal combustion, combustion car to the electric vehicle that we presented and how this probability of switching over to EV changed according to these different informational frames. So our first treatment group was to show just uh, the newest bit of information was right here, the uh, was euro per kilometer. So we added in this is the first bit of monetary uh, comparison difference that we showed in and actually had no effect on uh, that EV switch rate. Things start to change uh, big time once we go into different frames. So when we provided the cost differences of EV versus um, non-EV in terms of euros over 16,000 kilometers a year, we see quite a big jump actually in the EV switch rate. So it goes up by uh, about seven percentage points, uh, which is obviously significant. You can see the uh, confidence interval bars here and the zero line is, is straight down here. Uh, when we show that same information in terms of 10 years, it's also better than the control and, and better than the first treatment, uh, but there's no difference between the two. The next uh, set of results are from the carbon frame. So here we, we can only really compare this treatment four to treatment three because we're, we're in, uh, we have the same uh, euro in 10 years and then we're switching over to longer term uh, carbon uh, comparisons. When we added in the carbon over 10 year comparison, uh, we see a, 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 well, we have the highest uh, switch rate in, in, in this experiment. Uh, when we switch carbon to kilograms, it's, uh, again, it's, 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 it's significant and positive, but there's no difference between these two. So, you know, framing in tons or kilograms or grams doesn't really appear to matter, uh, which is a surprise to us because that was a, actually a very strong criticism we've been getting on our research in, in, in the last couple of years that we're, you know people are only switching because they're seeing bigger numbers. But when we show the bigger carbon, uh, um, when we show carbon in terms of grams or kilograms versus tons, it doesn't really have an effect. Finally, our, our two special case uh, treatments. So we looked at um, uh, monthly euro figures. So when we show the the the, the cost differences in terms of months, there isn't really, um, it's a smaller effect, still significant. And finally, we looked at the number of washing machine cycles. It actually seemed to work pretty well, but no real difference to, uh, to these other key, um, key results here. It's, 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 it is as effective as carbon frames um, in, in tons. So we find that our treatments, so generally when we look at the, the treatments that worked and looked at some interactions, uh, they, they, don't, they don't seem to work as well for the highest income group. Um, they work more for those who are concerned about climate change, which is the, the vast majority of our, our respondents. It's only those who don't really care about uh, climate change that it didn't work on. And in terms of our key hypothesis, in terms of um, imperfect information, we find that uh, it's higher for households that don't know or are uncertain about their monthly fuel costs. So these are questions asked before the, uh, the DCE. Uh, finally, uh, in terms of the, you know, obviously we're, I've talked about the framing effects, but if we look at the actual attributes from the DCE, um, all these results are significant as well. So when we take, uh, when the car price 
switches from the same as the internal combustion engine and switches to either 10%, 20% or 30% uh, higher, we can see that the switch rates go down and down and down. And these effects are very large. They're much bigger than the, than the framing effects. Also range is a, is a key factor. So our reference category was 500 kilometers, which is kind of the upper end of what we're seeing of, of, of new cars at the moment. Uh, when that, once that range goes down to uh, you know, two, 400, 300, 200, we can see that the probability of switching to EV goes down and down and down. Um, and again, that's to be expected, but the, the magnitude of the, of the results are, are, are very interesting here. Uh, ultra fast charging is a, is a big factor as well. Uh, you know, the ultra fast charging you can add in, uh, it's, it's, you're looking at almost you know, 300 kilometers in 10 minutes. Uh, that is a, a big factor for, for our uh, respondents as well. And finally, boot size. Uh, yeah, generally speaking, uh, well, particularly in the first round of EVs, it tended to have smaller boots because of batteries. Uh, they're kind of sorting that out a bit at the moment, though. Uh, but as we reduce the boot size, we can see that the probability of switching uh, also declined a little bit, but it not, not as much as, as these variables. They're the key ones over there. Uh, very finally, uh, we also asked uh, households about the concerns. And clearly, uh, most households are very concerned about aspects to do with batteries and charging, time to charge, availability of charging. And you can see that most of our respondents either said that they were extremely or moderately concerned. You know, we were looking at 60, 70, 80% in these cases, so it's big. Uh, the, the, what we did here is we split this sample by those who have traveled in an EV before and those who, who do have not. And we can see that prior experience in an EV uh, means that you're less concerned about all these factors. And that is consistent all the way down, that this blue bar is smaller than the yellow bar. Okay, to conclude, uh, framing of fuel efficiency really seems to matter. Um, but we can see from the other results that other factors are going to be more important. So the, the labeling is going to be one uh, aspect of this, this mass switch to EVs, but factors like price and range are going to be more important. There's no question about that. Uh, have we got hypothetical bias in our study? Possibly. Uh, you know, nothing's on the line in this. Now we did all, we did our best to try and make this as realistic as possible. But our, our next step now is to, is to run this field trial, which is, which is currently taking place with Ionda Ireland. So we're, we're working with uh, apps and displays and showrooms to see how uh, this information can, can affect uh, choices. So I've probably gone over time, so my apologies to, to the moderator for that. Um, any questions? And my email address is, is there as well. So please feel free to follow up by email and I'll be happy to answer any questions or I'd also be happy to take any questions now. Thanks very much. Thank you, James, for this presentation. Uh, is there some question? Uh, on... uh, Maybe I can it. ask a question. Or... Yeah. Thanks, Marco. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thanks, James. Uh, very nice presentation. Um, I have a question about the the CO two emissions from EVs um, yeah. that you calculate. I, maybe I missed it. But uh, from what I saw on the on the discrete choice card, you had like 40 grams uh, per kilometer written on there. Yeah. Um, so I think, well, in general, I think the EU calculates, well, zero emissions for electric vehicles. Yeah. Um, well, th that would make your calculation probably very, very difficult and uh, a bit nonsensical. But um, yeah, can you maybe say a little bit about that yeah i okay i mean zero co there's obviously look we know there's zero tailpipe emissions but uh, there's emissions from from generation mm -hmm. so it's it's really up to each country to to use their own carbon intensity of, of electricity um in ireland we you know last year we were, we were about 260 grams of co2 per kilowatt hour um or no more like 300 was used in this experiment because that's where it was at the time and depending on the weather, today I'm looking at the window here and there's no wind, so it's probably more like 460. Uh, whereas on, on a windy day, it, it is zero. So we're to, it, where to, what to present? I mean, there's clearly a, a carbon footprint of, of, of electricity and that has to be used in, in our opinion. I don't think many manufacturers are, 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 I think manufacturers are steering away from that zero carbon aspect. Um, I think people recognize that there is a footprint associated with their electricity. And so we use the Irish uh, carbon. Uh, I see how that might be a, a tricky in some countries if they are selling EVs as zero carbon. They're not zero carbon. Um, I, 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 I don't think that should be used. Um, 
I don't know, controversial, I guess. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I think so. In in Germany, I think the general opinion is that if you buy a, a electric vehicle, you probably also have a green electricity tariff at home yeah. and charge your car um, carbon free. But that's it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the we did think about these aspects, and uh, I mean, but also those 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 green tariffs as well. I mean, you know. On average, I, we're get looking at zero carbon electricity, but um, you know, from a from a personal perspective, I, I think we should steer away from 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 these types of messages because I'm uh, one of the big benefits of EVs is you know a lot of people are buying EVs for the carbon benefits. It really is um, it really is the key key variable in, in in these aspects. EV drivers will also be willing to change the timing of their consumption if they were aware of these uh, differences in carbon intensity, uh, depending on, on, on the renewable generation. And if we tell them that it's zero all the time, it's gonna be very hard to switch to that, no, would you please charge at certain times to help the grid? Uh, so ideologically, I, I disagree with that messaging uh, because the next step in EV communication will be about uh, renewable-based pricing or renewable-based information for the household. And like I said, obviously your EV is tremendously flexible. Um, you know, we drive an EV here, we charge up maybe once a week. And could I, cha could I charge tomorrow? Because tomorrow is going to be windy compared to today. Of course I could. Uh, so it, but that, that's going to be very hard to do if we tell households now that uh, it's zero carbon all the time. Anyway, that's a kind of a side question. It's very interesting, but uh, uh, perhaps uh, future research. Thank you very much for your question. Though. Just one more question, uh, James. Uh, in your survey, do you have any idea of uh, what is the percentage of uh, households that have access to home charging? Uh, do you have uh, also information about the daily trip they they do, or things like that? We do. We have we have um, we have more in depth results. We have we've collected all that information. So the type of household. For example, if, okay. if, um, if someone's living in an apartment block in Ireland, it's very unlikely that they will be able to, um, to install a charging point. And we see effects for that. See, we, we, we did look at the, the apartment variable um, and it does look like that those who live in apartments have lower uh, intention to switch. But then you've got other factors as well. Often that those who live in apartments, they could be younger, they've got a high, higher climate concern. Uh, it's, it's a complicated issue, but we do have that, those variables and we also have mileage as well. Um, one thing we did see with the households with extremely high mileage, they do seem to be really thinking about fuel efficiency already, obviously, and they tend to be more likely to switch as well. Um, so. Okay, thank you. And other questions? Yes, I have okay. a question. May I? You, okay. okay. Thank you. Uh, hello, James. Nice presentation and best wishes. So my question is related to the methodology. Uh, I'm not the expert of the particular methodology, but I'm intended to use this in my future uh, research work. So you did a discrete choice experiment, but this experiment through online survey, am I correct? You mentioned sure. there 2000. Yeah, it's, it's, all, it's all online. So there's nothing like lab experiment. So the 2000 responded, uh, what was the response rate? How many people you targeted and how many responses you have received? Yeah, our response rate was, um, what happens is we used a, what, what we, we used a survey company and we gave them certain quotas. Now a professional survey company will, will go away and use their own panels to fill these responses. So I don't actually know the, the, how many households rejected. All, all that happens is there's a screening process at the start of the survey, and then they okay. can head in. Now, I, that, that is information I could, I, could, I could find out. But at the end of the day, no, the survey company is being no, asked to, no. to fill. Important. It's not important. My question is basically that when you do such experiment, which is not lab-based, so yeah. what are the major limitations? because you you also mentioned that you did this uh, randomized control error method also uh, the, the treatment so yeah. what is the limitations when you have such experiments yeah well i would i i would i would say that this is although it's a it's a survey experiment it's very similar to a lab experiment if we brought uh, respondents into a lab we'd be doing exactly the same thing they're just doing it in in, in their house so it is uh, that this element of the survey is 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 very much like like a lab experiment 
um, there is experimentation within it and it, it changes as they flow through the through, through the survey. The, the, the problems with doing something like this is clearly it's, it's a hypothetical situation. So if you are if you're conducting a DCE, um, often let's just say uh, businesses use this methodology if they are, for example, uh, launching a new product and they want to see what the demand for that new product is and trying to find out what elements of that product are important. So they break that product into attributes and they randomize them and ask um, households to, 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 to choose. So that's the general use of DCEs. Now in our, in our circumstance, uh, we're doing something different. We're not, it's not a new product. It's something that households are familiar with already. Uh, many households have gone through this process already. So the hypothetical bias, which is your main concern is that, you know, there's no, you know, you can, I can pick EV every time and, uh, you know, I don't have to pay for it. It's, it's, it's a hypothetical situation. But generally, there are a few little tricks that you can do. The first off is it's up to the researcher to make this scenario and situation as realistic as possible. So it's all about, that's, that's why we use this, this, um, this very involved process of getting people to choose their car color, their engine, their car size, to think about their budget, to think about their family. And at that stage, you've taken a hypothetical situation and made it a little bit more realistic. And that can help with hypothetical bias. And surprisingly, if you, if you basically, if you ask households to really think about their budgets and try and be honest, surprisingly, they, 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 they act like that. Um, but hypothetical bias is an issue. Now, one thing you can do with a DCE to help with hypothetical bias is by randomizing different treatments within this methodology. So you take a baseline DCE, which is our control group. Now, the results from that control group are potentially problematic. But what we're already doing is randomizing different pieces of information into that baseline. So the comparison of uh, treatment effects on potentially a biased baseline, it should be somewhat robust. Uh, but potentially, I, I can see why people are, are concerned about the DCE in itself. But using a, an experimental uh, you know, treatment randomization process on a, a slightly biased process should still be somewhat robust. Um, so yeah, and studies have found that, uh, you know, the, well, some studies find, some studies don't, that uh, the, the effects from stated preference and, and revealed preference can be quite similar. Um, give me a shout. Uh, you know, if you're running something like this in the future, I'd be happy to, to, to chat about the problems and ways to overcome them. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome. Okay. Thank you, James. I think it will be time to, to jump to the second presentation. Perfect. Name uh, And if there's some more question, I think we can come back at the end of the, the session. The second uh, presentation name individual mobility, more choice and effect on public uh, transport subsidies, evidence from a randomized control trial uh, would, would be done by uh, Marco Oswartz. Uh, Marco uh, has been researcher in the Department of Environment and Resources at the RWI Leibniz Institute for Economics in Essen, Germany, since 2017. He received his uh, PhD in economics in 2019 from the Ruhr uh, University Bochum. His main research interests lie in the empirical question about energy and environmental economics. In particular, he is interested in current issues in the economics of mobility and transport. For instance, in his research, Marco has investigated question on car taxation in Germany or effect of information about car driving on the willingness to pay for public transport. His research has been published in numerous in numbers of uh, different peer-reviewed journals, such as Nature, Energy Economics, and Energy Journal. Marco, the floor is yours now. Yeah, thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so let me share my screen. Okay, so I think you can see my screen now. Yes, we can. Um, so, yeah, let, let me let me start quickly that uh, saying that I was a bit surprised that uh, my paper was in the uh, electric vehicle for individual mobility session, um, as the so as you you might expect more of uh, of questions like the one James asked and the. On electric cars and so on, but and and my my research is more on 
yeah, public transport and how does public transport affect car driving behavior? But then again, I think uh, it actually kind of makes sense and public transport uh, is already mostly electric. So, so uh, light rail trains are usually electric. Um, so uh, here I'm presenting joint research with Mark Andor, he's also at the RWI Institute and Andreas Gerster from the University of Mannheim. Um, so to a brief uh, introduction, so car traffic still dominates the, the traffic volume in Germany. Um, and as such, the, the transport sector in Germany is, is the only sector where the CO2 has not decreased since 1990. So in general, CO2 has, has decreased quite a bit in Germany. But um, I think in the EU overall, it has, has risen since 1990. And in Germany, it has risen a little bit, but yeah, mostly stay the same. And yeah, I, I think one, we probably all agree that one possible solution to reduce um, CO2, or one possible solution to reduce CO2 from car driving is, uh, of course, uh, reducing CO2 emissions from cars, uh, like with electric cars, but also another one would be to transition away from car traffic to public transport. Um, so for this purpose in this study, we um, investigate how a one month uh, free public transport ticket um, affects um, the public transport uptake and if there is any habit formation. Um, so a number of studies has already um, has already um, in, uh, investigated similar questions, but uh, we are the first to, to use a smartphone app to record actual mobility, uh, very finely grained for over three months. Um, so what do we do? As I said, we do a randomized controlled trial. We use a smartphone app to track individual's mobility. Um, we basically split the uh, individuals up in a control and a treatment group and the treatment group receives a one month ticket for the second month for the region they live in. Um, and yeah, this basically gives us the, the two main research questions. First of all, do we actually see any increase in public transport uptake among the car drivers? And if so, um, do they still use more public transport um, in the months after they received the free ticket where they would have to pay themselves for public transport? So uh, let me give you a, an overview about the field experiment. Um, we did this in the spring and summer of 2018. Um, this was done in conjunction with uh, the Survey Institute Forza. Uh, we started in February um, where we screened people who were potentially willing to participate in the app tracking. So uh, we wanted, so we asked them what kind of smartphone do they use? They, they uh, needed to have like a current um, or an iPhone with current software or a, a Android phone with current software. Um, then also we asked them whether they already own a public transport ticket as we uh, especially wanted to target uh, habitual car drivers and not give people who already use public transport uh, quite extensively a free ticket. Um, yeah, then this gave us uh, yeah, uh, around, uh, yeah, this gave us quite a, quite a lot people were potentially interested in participating in the app tracking. And then at the end of April, um, we, we started the experiment with a, a survey. Um, in the survey, we, we asked uh, the people, yeah, quite a, a number of questions on their mobility behavior. Um, what kind of cars do they own? How much do they drive? Um, what are the attitudes towards public transport and towards uh, climate change? Um, and then at the end of the survey, it was stated again 
look uh, in February 2018, you said like you would be potentially interested in participating in the app tracking. Is this still the case? If yes, click here. Um, and then they were um, they were forwarded to the to the app provider where they had to download the app and then um, register with their username. Um, then so this was the the twenty third or this started the twenty third of April. We had a bit of a staggered start. Uh, we did this in the 10, 10 of the largest tra transport and traffic associations in Germany. So basically this covers the 10 largest uh, metropolitan areas in Germany. Um, and then May 2018 was the baseline months where we just tracked their mobility behavior without giving them any kind of information or treatment um, just to see what they, they're doing in a, a normal kind of months. Um, and then at the end of or uh, during May, uh, we we randomly assigned each participant either to the treatment or the control group. Um, we um, we we, um, we did this so that uh, for every region there was uh, an equal share of uh, people in the treatment and the control group. Um, basically both the uh, control and treatment group received a letter at the end of May. Um, the control group received a letter with some information about the smartphone app um, and the treatment group additionally received the, the ticket uh, that was valid for the city and region where they live in, um, as well as uh, some general information about public transport in the region. Um, the validity of the ticket we're sending them and how to find um, yeah how to to go on public transport there and then um, so these were sent out at the 27th of May um, and then from 1st of June till the, the 30th of June the ticket was valid um, we still track the mobility and then afterwards uh, from July 1st to July 31st, um, this was the habit formation month, so the, the ticket was not valid anymore, but we still um, observed the, the mobility behavior by the participants. Um, so what does this app tracking look, look like? Basically, it provides us with observations for every trip taken by the, by the participants. So here you see a couple of screenshots what a typical participant would see. Um, so you can see here every day that, so this is not from the experiment, but uh, from the app provider, but uh, basically you see for every day you can click on it. And at the end of the day, you were also, so the participants were asked if uh, the day was tracked correctly. Um, if everything was tracked correctly, you could save it. If not, you could, um, you can change the mode, for example. Um, and basically, uh, we receive uh, uh, a lot of information on the on the used mode, the start and finish time of every trip, the distance and the speed. And also for the mode, we we know um, yeah a lot of different modes. So we know if it's a light rail, long distance train, car, bike. Uh, a ferry or ship um, and uh, yeah so basically what we do is um, as I said we have the the observation is on a trip level we collapse it on the day level um, uh, with this we then have uh, have the number of trips and kilometers per day for each day and each participants um, and then, well, for us, the, the most important um, variable is the, the, the public transport variable. Uh, what we do is we add up all different modes of public transport, so bus, light rail, and so on. Um, we, we check this calculation against different specifications to make sure this does not drive our results. For example, in some cases, it might be difficult to um, 
to distinguish the long distance train from light rail. So for example, uh, if one person drives uh, a long way with the light rail in a very populated area, then this could be mistaken for a long distance train or the other way around. Um, yeah, we checked the we check this variable for different specifications um, and we don't see that this is particularly um, important or this does not drive our results. Uh, another challenge with, uh, with the app was that uh, if a participant turned their phone off and on again, um, the tracking basically stopped. Um, and then when they reopened the app, to get the tracking going again, um, they would need to, to open the app again. Um, so we we sometimes so we, we sometimes see some gaps um, in in the uh, in the day. So there are, might be some days that are not tracked. Um, and we were worried about that uh, that this was particular, so that this could lead to attrition and this would be higher in the control group. Um, we checked this so far and this doesn't seem to be the case. Um, but we are currently working on the inverse probability weighting to, to be sure about this. Uh, let me show you the number of participants per day. Um, so in general, we see here that there is some, well, you, so on the weekends, uh, people track less. Um, in general, it seems like the, the treated participants are a bit higher than the non-treated participants. Um, but in general, it's uh, very stable over the, the time period. Um, we also, in the survey, we, um, we asked the participants about the, uh, the mobility they did uh, seven days before the survey was taken. So of course, it's another time period, but this also, so if we validate this uh, seven days with uh, our baseline months, um, it's very, very close. So the numbers are very close. Um, here you can see also the first and the last day reported. Um, as I said, we had a bit of a staggered start. We wanted to do it with a bit fewer, uh, a lower number of regions because that would have been, been much easier to do. But um, yeah, because uptake was not so high, uh, we had to, uh, to have uh, more regions. Um, but then uh, in general, so the important thing is here, most people stay until the end. Um, of course, you have a, a, a couple of people who already stop uh, after the first day or who, who start uh, right at the, at the finish, basically. Um, but uh, the vast majority, so, and these drop out of our analysis, of course, but the vast majority really starts uh, sometimes, uh, sometime in May and, and sometimes in July. So we have, um, yeah, days in, in every month. Um, here are some descriptives and uh, baseline travel behavior for the treatment and control group. Um, just quickly, um, as I said, we, we targeted especially car drivers, um, which you can see here that the average car trips per day is 2.17. So yeah, basically every, on average, every person drives somewhere and drives somewhere back. Uh, the average public transport and train trips per day are only at 0.22. So the the uh, how I would uh, interpret this number is um, you take public transport every five days or maybe every 10 days you take public transport somewhere and go back. Um, we have overall 42, uh, 422 participants uh, in our analysis that track in every month. Um, pretty much half and half in treatment and control group. Um, um, just give me a bit time to show you the mobility behavior, behavior during the experimental period. Um, so this is not um, differentiated between 
treatment and control. However, already here you see that there is uh, some kind of increase um, in June for public transport, um, but this is reversed in July. Um, car trips basically stay the same over the, the time period. And yeah. So um, what does our estimation look like? Basically, it's very sim uh, simple in the, in, in the basic case. Um, we have a number of different dependent variables. So this is the trips or the kilometers of a given mode. Um, we have an indicator whether participant received the treatment for the given day. Uh, we have an indicator if um, participant was treated, but the day was after the treatment period. Uh, furthermore, we, as I said uh, earlier, we're currently working on an estimation of inverse probability weights. Um, this then um, controls for a potential stronger panel attrition for the control group. Um, first indications are that this doesn't change our results. Uh, however, we're still um, working on this and um, yeah, there's still work in progress. But let's look at the results. Um, here we, we have the trips for different modes as a dependent variable. Um, we can see here uh, the, the treatment increases the uptake for public transport by 0.12 trips. Um, you might say, well, 0.12 trips, that's uh, that's not a, a whole lot. And of course, you're right. However, uh, keep in mind that um, the average number of public transport trips uh, is already just at 0.22. So this is basically a one third increase uh, in the public transport trips. Um, also, the walking trips are also increasing. This kind of makes sense because, uh, well, I would say that walking is basically complementary to public transport. You're probably walking to the train station from your home and then maybe from the train station to your workplace or to wherever you're going. Um, interestingly, we don't see any effect on car trips. So the point estimate is even negative, but it's insignificant. Um, of course, uh, from the out, um, well, from what I said in the motivation, one, one idea to reduce CO2 would be to, um, to increase uptake for public transport. But what we find here is that this doesn't reduce the, the car trips. And so, of course, it also wouldn't reduce the CO2 emitted by cars. Um, and then finally, for the habit formation, we don't see anything. So, yeah, the, the point estimate is very close to zero for public transport. Um, yeah, and in all cases, in quite cases, it's negative. So, yeah, if anything, so the treatment uh, increases uh, public transport usage during the treated period, but not afterwards. Um, basically, we we see the same um, if we look at uh, the kilometers. Um, we also did a number of different specifications, as I said, for the for public transport. Um, the results stay basically the same. So uh, the magnitude and the significance is um, uh, is very similar. We also looked at um, we also did some robustness checks. If we only look at uh, people who track a minimum number of days per month, um, this also doesn't change our results. Um, so basically, this already brings me to the end. Um, the study, so we provide evidence on the effect of a provision of a free public transport to car drivers. Um, what we see is they, we, uh, they do use public transport during the treated month. Um, the effect is uh, well, overall quite low, but given that the, the baseline public transport usage of public transport is, uh, is not so high, it, this might not be surprising, but yeah, car travel does not seem to 
be affected at all by the treatment. And we also do not observe any sign of habit formation. So yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you, Marco, for this uh, presentation. Uh, is there any question in the public? So if not, I have uh, one question, if that's one. okay. Okay. Um, yeah, on. just just it seems it seems unusual that uh, car trips didn't decline if uh, public transport went up. So your your you you basically just. People, your your treatment led to just more 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 movement of, of individuals, really, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, so um, yeah, we're currently looking at this, and so I think one early indication what we see is that I think the people use it mostly on the weekends, the ticket. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so maybe they use it to to make a. I don't know a, a trip um, to to the lake or I don't know, um, but in general. So where we also and yeah, of course you you're perfectly right. Uh, in, it increases mobility overall. Um, where we also want to investigate in the future as um, what kind of uh, participants are mostly affected by. It. So it could be that indeed it is the the low income participants mm. that then use their ticket to yeah to do a, a trip they would otherwise not do and then well this would be a, a silver lining after all i would say uh, i think uh, uh, i have some, one comment i think this is because of the rebound effect and it has been very found very significant, especially in energy efficiency, energy area, because what people think that I have some savings now. So rather than they think that they are reducing their consumption, they try to now enjoy that savings. And that's why it's, it's, it's not reduce the consumption, rather it, you know, uh, increase the consumption. So basically it is the rebound effect that can uh, be interesting future work. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I haven't thought about the rebound effects in this uh setting before but yeah, I, I have to think about it but yeah, that's a interesting point thanks yeah it, it seems that in your study uh, uh, do, do you have the, an idea of the uh, time at which the the, the, the the trips are done in your application just to see uh, yeah. uh, because I, we guess that the commuters have not uh, changed their habits and the uh, they, they still use the, the, the car to, to go to work and come back because uh, we see that the uh, car tri trips has not changed. And we see also that you have increased the mobility because you have uh, uh, more uh, transport, uh, uh, public transport usage uh, du during your experiment. So it means that uh, uh, the mobility has increased outside of the, the, the commuting period. And you said it that it's uh, mainly on the weekend. Is yep. that right? Yeah, you're right. Um, so yeah, we do have the, the times uh, of the trips. So that's a bit tricky to work on, but we're, um, so this is also on our mind for the future to see um, um, well, what kind of trips? So we don't we don't know um, the uh, what the trip is about, but we could infer that, for example, in the morning between seven and nine, it's probably commuting for work, and um, also yeah. in the evening, and um, yeah, to see. That's what we do. to just what we what we do we are with our connected car, uh, we we see uh, what is the period in which the the, the car is taken. <laughs> Yeah, just to have an idea if it's for work or not. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, definitely a good idea. Another question. Hmm. If uh, the time allows keep... from the public audience, uh, I would have a question out of interest. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, did you look because I can imagine? So you said you targeted the ten biggest cities, uh, right? And um, I could imagine that the costs and benefits for each city of taking 
public transport differ somewhat? Do you and you, you seem to have quite a large sample size? So actually, did you look at the effects for uh, different cities? And is there um, is there is there any yeah heterogeneous treatment effects? Come. Yeah. So um, yeah, we would like to do that, but um, so yeah, I I also I didn't say much about the, the cities where we did it. So the, the biggest area where we did the, um, the study was in the Rhine Ruhr area. Um, and oh, I also, so I forgot, they, they also sponsored part of the tickets. I, I should mention this at the talk. Um, and the second uh, largest area or the second biggest area was the, the Berlin area. Um, and then yeah, Stuttgart and Munich and others. However, I think so in general, I think only the Rhine Ruhr area and the Berlin area would allow for um, for a heterogeneity analysis. I think um, as I said, we have 10 different um, um, areas and around 400 participants. So if the number of observations is not quite high enough to um, to do this kind of heterogeneity analysis. And for for the two biggest ones, we we don't see uh, large differences. All right, thank you. Okay, I think it would be time to jump to the last uh, presentation of the session, name modeling uh, the impact of weather condition and passenger mobility. So I'd like to welcome our last uh, uh, speaker, Monica Gupka. Um, Monica has completed his, uh, her PhD in the economics and business environment area from the Indian Institute of Management in Lucknow. She has around six years of experience in teaching and before joining SPG IMR. She worked as an assistant professor in the economics and finance area of, uh, in BITS Pelini on Pelini campus. Um, she is qualified in junior research fellowship from national eligibility test and she has a master degree in economics from Lucknow University where she received gold medal for securing the highest mark in the area. She has been awarded for with the most prestigious Paul R. Lawrence Fellowship to participate in the uh, National American Case Research Association, NACA, in 2019. Uh, uh, 2019. She has public, uh, published research paper in peer-reviewed journals like Energy Economics, Journal of Cleaner Production, Energy Policy and Transport Policy, and presented her work in various national and international conferences. Conferences. She also uh, she has also attended training and workshops organized by MIT Sloan School of Management, National University of Singapore, Nanyang Technological University, and BITS Pilene. So, Monica, floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, so, I'm going to present my recent paper. Uh, the title of the paper is Modeling the Impact of Weather Conditions on Passenger Mobility, and it is co-authored with one more uh, researcher. Uh, so we know that transport has very important role in any economy's growth. At the same time, both the passenger mobility as well as the transport system is the backbone for any country's economic growth. Uh, in case of India, it has a significant share of around 4.2% in India's GDP. And we also know that transport is in the world is responsible for the local pollutants such as the volatile organic compounds, particulate matter, sulfur dioxide, carbon monoxide. And this is how it is also responsible for the world's uh, GHG emission. This particular sector, the contribution in the GHG emission is doubled, has doubled since 1970 and increasing at a faster rate than any other end use sector. On the other hand, issues like extreme weather conditions, climate change, and GHG emission have become a challenge for the betterment of urban transport mobility and passenger behavior towards the choice of more travel mode. So we know that transport is 
uh, transport has very significant role towards the GHG emission and the local pollution. But there is another relationship, which is the after effects of this particular relationship that when there is a pollution, when there is a GHG emission, because of that, there is a climate change. And due to climate change, there is a abrupt climate activities. And, you know, there is a lot of disruption in the local weather condition. And how this weather condition is affecting, going to affect the transport system as well as the passenger mobility. So this relationship is a two-way. And the first relationship has been, you know, researched significantly by the various researcher, but we are in this research are focusing on the second part that how this, because of the climate change, how this extreme weather conditions are affecting the transport as well as the passenger mobility. So we know that because of this uh, climate change, the frequency of the extreme weather condition has also increased. Recently in India, there is a two cyclones, that is the Taute and uh, one more cyclone, which has devastated many, uh, not many lives, but yes, there is a lot of economic losses. Transport disruption due to the meteorological conditions, such as congestion, delayed trips, cancelled necessary travel for work, and services responsible for the huge economic losses. At the same time, because of this disruption in regular traffic, there, this particular phenomena is responsible for the safety issues. There is a research which shows that because of the high temperature, wind speed and humidity, there are more accidents. As compared to logistic transport, the passenger transport is more vulnerable and uh, it is important to understand this relationship that how this particular extreme weather condition is going to affect the passenger mobility the, because of the various reasons, because uh, the occupancy level, the role of public versus private transport, uncertainty, uh, and also the choices of transport. Because if there is a disruption in the weather condition, the, it is uh, going to affect significantly the passenger movements. Over the years, due to the climate change and disruptions, resilient transport infrastructure became the need of the hour because of the safety. And at the same time, it should also be for the better transport experience. The aim of the study that is to affect the relationship of uh, extreme weather condition on passenger transport is in line with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals 9 and 11, especially SDG 11.2 states that by 2030 provide access to safe, affordable, accessible, and sustainable transport system for all, improving road safety, notably by expanding public transport with special attention to the need of, the, need of those in vulnerable situations. This study addresses the impact of daily weather condition on passenger mobility in case of Mumbai, lo local trains in Mumbai which are the backbone of this particular city's transport system and stand alone contributes to 50% of passenger movement in the city. So the objective of the study is to analyze the role of weather condition on passenger mobility in case of the Mumbai suburban railways. We have taken three major weather condition, the temperature, humidity, and wind speed. And uh, also the passenger mobility is uh, uh, measured in the number of tickets sold through three major ticket booking system, the, uh, the booking category. That is the reserve category, unreserved category, and directly from the booking offices. Why we have taken the particular case of Mumbai, uh, in case of India, Mumbai is a, uh, is a business hub and the major city in the country. And uh, the particular phenomena is important in case of Mumbai because of the climatic and the geographical condition of the city. It is on the west coast and it has a high population density. The traffic and congestion is also uh, become, has, has, been, has become a big problem in, for the commuters. At the same time, this particular public transport, the suburban railways, which is the intra-city transport, is the oldest network or railway network in of Asia. Uh, as I told that uh, Mumbai is the business hub, it has economic significance. And among us, the 14 major cities of India, the share of public transport is highest in Mumbai, 
which is around 78% in 2017 so uh, in this 78% of public transport the uh, the to total of 50% is contributed by the suburban railways so the fundamental research question is how weather condition affect the total passenger mobility of mumbai suburban railways if you see the brief literature review uh, in nutshell the studies have analyzed this phenomena but uh, mostly they focus on the rain and temperature a uh, few studies focus on the humidity wind speed precipitation and other factors uh, uh, but not in case of india and particularly uh, in case of mumbai uh, mirza highlighted that analyzing these extreme weather condition is important especially for the developing countries because they are more vulnerable uh, due to this uh, climate change and this particular study suggested that rather than focusing on the disaster management these countries should prepare to deal such uh, conditions and there should be more focus on creation on the adaptive capacity inclement weather condition affect transit in many ways such as increased travel time disruption in services discomfort to passenger and menace to safety and health uh, bocker in uh, bocker et al in netherland and jao et al in china analyze that people's reaction and behavior due to adverse weather condition uh, is also important and they found that behavioral factors has also significant role in transport ridership so due to these inclement weather condition they are going to affect the passenger behavior and that is that has also important role in the mobility so overall all the studies depicted the high effect of weather on on transport mobility so what we found in the research that most of the research uh, or the studies are focused on the demand side problem uh basically there are a lot of consumer surveys and primary data research but uh, not uh, more on the secondary data and the supply side factors as per best of our knowledge or research there is no study which considered the wind speed wind speed humidity and temperature all together as important factor in relation to passenger mobility in a city like mumbai Uh, the study used wavelet current model and quantile and quantile regression which are also new and rarely used by any study to analyze the association between meteorological conditions and public transport so the this is the theoretical framework that we have taken the passenger mobility in mumbai suburban railways and we have segregated in terms in terms of the total passenger traveled and the passenger that how they buy the ticket because if you are in a reservation and you have already pre booked plan then it is difficult to cancel but if you are going to travel and you just need to buy the ticket from the direct booking office that due to this inclement weather condition you will not like to travel and how uh, we we segregated the effect in order to see that which is the important factor and how it is associated to the people's behavior as i discussed the three major Uh, weather condition that is the temperature humidity wind speed the empirical model we have validated to by this uh, particular relationship which i have already defined at passenger mobility uh, i define the three different mobility in terms of the ticketing category and in case of uh, meteorological condition j define the matrix of the three weather conditions which we have taken is the segregate uh, segregation of the ticketing system and the temperature so the study used the daily data from 2012 to march september 2012 to march 2017 and it was the confidential data collected from the mumbai rail vikas corporation the number of passengers given in the lakhs of tickets sold via three booking system to track passenger mobility uh i just discussed about these three tech ticketing category that is the passenger reservation system pa uh, unreserved ticketing system and third is the directly from the booking office so these are the three major ticketing category uh the weather information is obtained from the indian meteorological department the major variables used in the model are total passenger measured in lakhs uh, mean temperature in celsius mean humidity this relative measured in percentage 
and mean wind speed kilometer per hour. Since it is the daily data, the seasonality and auto correlation in the data have been taken care of. Uh, we, because it is a high frequency or daily data, we need to check the stationarity. You use the quantile unit root test as well as the normal unit root test. Uh, why quantile? Because we are going to use the quantile and quantile model. So augmented Dickey Fuller test, Phillips person, uh, Phillips parent test, and uh, for the quantile uh, or unit root test, we have used the test uh, established by the Quenker and Zhao. And below is the equation to check the stash stationarity on conditional mean. Uh, then we also check the co-integration by the Johansson co-integration test. And at the quantile level, we use the test given by Zhao 2009. So the equation is uh, uh, used to check the vector error correction model given by the Johansson. In order to check the relationship uh, or the co-movement and directional association among the variables, we have used the multiple wavelet coherence model. So basically it decomposes the time series in different time frequency. And it is also helpful to know which are the leading and lagging variables. Quantile and quantile regression, uh, because uh, given the high frequency data uh, and uh, non-linearity in the data, we use this particular model it based on the, uh, 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 basically this particular model takes care of the heteroscedasticity assumption. And it is uh, better than the traditional uh, regression approach as there is a traditional quantile regression approach. And that's why it helps to unify both the methodology to analyze the quantiles of the two model, model parameters. Basically, in this model, we take the quantiles of the dependent as well as the independent variables. So results and major findings. These are the major graphs. Just a second. These are the major graphs and results which we have found from our analysis. And uh, due to the paucity of time, I'm not going to discuss these in, in uh, detail. Rather, I'll present the summary of the results on major findings. So what did we find? Uh, that first we check the stationarity. So model parameters were found st stationary at first difference. And thereby we found that there is a first order integration uh, among the model parameters. Non-linear co-integration association among the model parameters. And that's why it is helpful to use the Q quantile and quantile regression model. The result of the wavelet coherence portrays that the negative association of aggregate passenger movement with temperature and humidity in short run and medium run. But in case of the long run, the results are mixed. In case of the passenger wind association, the results are mixed and the co-movement is found to be both negative as well as positive in short to medium term. Whereas in the long run, the relationship is periodic and it, it follows some kind of the uh, uh, pattern or the cycle. All three variables, that is the temperature, humidity and wind are found to be leading indicators and which act as the predictor for the passenger movement in aggregate mobility. So therefore it is helpful to predict the passenger movement if there is such situations and which shows that their relationship is uh, significant it affects the passenger movement. Uh, the selected variables are found to be serially correlated with the passenger mobility. In case of the segregation in terms of the booking system, we found it both mixed and differential results. And it shows that ticket service may have a different role. For example, people with monthly pass are more likely to travel irrespective of the meteorological conditions. Whereas the people who buy a daily ticket, either from the booking office or e-ticket, which is unreserved system, decision of traveling may get changed. The result of the quantile and quantile regression showed that the rise in temperature leads to decrease in the total number of passenger traveled. However, the differential results at different quantiles show that at the peak of temperature, people try to avail the services that reflect travelers' adaptability to the continuous increase in the temperature. So basically, if there is an increase in the temperature or, the, or there is a peak in the temperature, people try to adapt themselves and uh, they want, would like to travel. 
humidity has a positive relationship with passenger movement in all the quantiles nevertheless the rise in the passenger movement due to humidity is declining it shows that initially humidity may not have a powerful impact on the passenger movement but if humidity prevails people may feel tired and dehydrated and thus reducing the increase in the passenger movement in case of the passenger wind relationship it shows a periodic fluctuation in the in the impact and the result are more segregated and vary across the three booking system the result show that impact of extreme weather condition tend to converge for the aggregate analysis whereas when we analyze on the basis of the three different ticketing system it largely differs so conclusion what are the policy implication that it shows that uh in case of public transport this specifically suburban transport the results are helpful because it gives some kind of guidance for the future planning and it can also be implemented uh, uh, used by the cities which has the similar geographical conditions in addressing the disruption of the timely reaction will help for in passenger movement and passenger demand and uh, because passenger will have more facility and then they can you know if we can support the planner or the public transport people can give them more facility to accommodate with the disruption in the weather conditions so the, the adaptation to different practices for dealing with adverse climate may be helpful in passenger movement or traffic shift due to unpleasant windy warm and humid atmosphere so therefore it is essential to manage potential amenities improve operational efficiency such as more ac coaches seating facility in the shelter shedding shelter services elevator consumer friendly and additional services so the people who are not aware let me just quickly clarify mumbai suburban railways as i mentioned it is a asia's oldest network and it is very old so there are not many ac coaches and um, there is a traditional not too much sitting seating facilities even at the platforms also you may not find the shelter etc and therefore even if the suburban railways is contributing in the public transport uh, hugely people it is not very consumer friendly especially when we have the uh, inclement weather conditions so it the Uh, it will also help to explore that what are the ways to improve the services. For example, in temperature, if there is a high temperature, and since there is an association, what should be done by the transport infrastructure, a uh, transport planner, and how they can improve the infrastructure so that they, they can be some sustainability in the passenger movement during the weather fluctuations. These effects are likely to be helpful for the design transport planner and in terms of designing the transport infrastructure. during extreme weather conditions the suburban railways has prominent importance compared to any other mode in the city and therefore it is important to address such issues and tackle the weather conditions because it will not only help in the mobility to sustain the mobility and increase the mobility as well as it also help in the safety of the passengers because sometime people people are high de, high dehydrated and they get faint and it also affect their health uh, and over the period of time sometime there is a issues of the accidents so what are the scope of the future research so we can also include uh, the study the other cities uh, in india as well as some cities abroad for the similar kind of analysis also we can uh, the future research can be done to analyze weather effect on the other modes of transport because in this study we only focused on the suburban railways uh, in case of public transport we can also focus on the other mode of public transport as well as the private transport uh i also mentioned that people behavior is also important but this is in this study we have not focused that aspect so nudging people behavior for adaptation of public transport by providing user friendly support infrastructure will have a substantial effect in retaining the passenger ridership more comprehensive work in terms of including all the passenger transport the seasonal fluctuations and other factors into consideration the limitation first of all we have not taken the rain effect as i mentioned that mumbai is the coastal city so rain is also important factor but there are few reasons first of all this particular 
whether extreme weather effect has, has been studied in the research by, in the previous studies. Second, the rain effect is prominent only for a few months, whereas, uh, you know, when there is a rainy season. So since we have a annual data, yearly data, it is difficult to, you know, uh, segregate this effect. And that's why we have taken only three weather conditions. Uh, further, in terms of the ticketing system, we are uh, on the basis of the passenger movement through this ticketing system, we have taken uh, the typical three ticketing system, but there can be the broader analysis when, uh, you know, we have the, uh, what we can say, we have the passenger movement in terms of the need and the behavior in terms of the a reason that why they travel and why don't they travel during such inclement weather conditions. So such, seg such segregation is also important. So any question, feedback, suggestions, since it is the uh, plenary results, I will be happy to answer or uh, to incorporate in my study. Thank you. So thank you, Monica, for this uh, interesting presentation. Just to have one question, do you think that uh, when you observe less mobility in the railway uh, transport, it comes with report on other uh, transport system, or it's more sickness in the, the people that uh, cannot uh, travel? Uh, do you have um, possibility to check to, I don't know, the hospital or number of, uh, uh, I don't know really much your, your country, it's sorry for, for that, but uh, uh, is there something in the um, medical system that can help to uh, have a correlation between the, the, the lack of mobility or it's only a report on other transport uh, system? Uh, so basically, what we found is there is some effect in the mobility. Now, coming back to the health effects, we have not studied in this particular uh, research. And the another reason that the country like India, which is very highly populated, and uh, at the same time, the poor population is also very high. What happened that such health effects are usually neglected by the people. They are major you know, major health reasons. So, but what at the same time we are saying that because of such weather condition, there is some effect and due to some effect that if this, these defects persist, that will be responsible for the greater, uh, you know, why uh, more accidents, etc. And uh, primarily we are saying that there is some decrease in the mobility. So addressing these particular health issues and we are saying, if we say that this is because of the passenger mobility and we should address this, that will not make sense. Because at the same time, I told you that this railway network is widely used by the people of Mumbai. And obviously these people are the lower middle class or the poor people, sometime middle class. Now they, they will not much think that today is the, I'm dehydrated, I got faint, I will not travel tomorrow because if they don't travel, how will they earn? So that's why in that sense, we are saying that yes, there is an effect. And if we can't, you know, if there is a demand side that people should adapt, we can't expect that. Rather, we should improve the infrastructure and provide some additional facility to deal with these specific weather conditions. Sure, thank you. Some other questions? Any other question? Got still nine minutes to for the end of the session, so there is uh, plenty of room for questions. Um, so I would have some more question. What is your 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 next? Uh, uh, research uh, on that topic? Uh, did, do you plan something uh, complementary uh, in the future? Uh, so uh, currently, the, we are also refining the results of this particular study, but I, I will be more interested in addressing the behavioral issues because, uh, you know, uh, that, that has an important role. Because if there is not improved, there's no improvement in infrastructure, sometimes there is a, some kind of uh, 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 says, you know, some kind of the, some problems which you cannot address in terms of the infrastructure, maybe because of the uh, additional economic facility, additional money, or, uh, you know, additional space requirement, etc. then how people will respond. 
so that that uh, how the behavioral aspects have the important role and how they can be addressed that that i'm planning okay uh, thank you and for the two other speakers what what are the complementary work that uh, you plan to do uh, on the subject is it possible to develop a bit well i yeah um from from our side we did i guess the paper i presented today was a, a continuation of work we've done before uh we've we've researched uh, similar research questions in the context of uh, household appliance decisions and household property decisions uh, very little effect in appliances but we ran a, a large field trial with uh, property and um, these types of cost forecast differences did have a quite a large effect on on the property market here uh, the next stage for us is to see if our, our our stated preference results hold up in a revealed preference setting. So we're, um, like I mentioned, <clears throat> we're going into showrooms across Ireland, installing information in half of the showrooms in, in Ireland in relation to this. Uh, so that's that's really uh, what's going to take place for us in, in the next uh, six months. Uh, that's already well underway. And... Uh, we are having issues with COVID though, because uh, obviously a tablet is, a, is something you touch um, and that's pro proving to be a bit of an issue, but that situation is obviously improving over the next few months. So fingers crossed. Yeah. Marco. <laughs> yeah, um, our project is also kind of a, well, larger research ag agenda on like switching from car to, to public transport uh, what are the influences? So we also have some research on um, also information about cars uh, cost and um, CO2 emissions. How does that influence uh, switching uh, to public transport and the willingness to pay? Um, and in general, so if the uh, one idea is also if the possibility arises we can do something similar like the app tracking again, uh, maybe for a longer horizon, because um, that might be also the case for the habit formation that one month is just not long enough. Um, and yeah. And in gen general terms to uh, all of you, uh, do you have, uh, let's say, a contact with other uh, university or research group that are doing similar things in uh, some other regions? Uh, or it's difficult to just to, to see if there are some local habits or uh, bias or it's uh, if you can compare let's say first in europe if uh, the case of ireland is quite completely different to germany or uh, france or things like that and uh, same for you in, in india you 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 mention uh, work uh, in uh, uh, brazil did you have some contact with the, the researchers or is it something that can be don't. No, yeah. I didn't, but let, let me try. Yes, it's a good idea because they do research in terms of China and yes, Brazil. Okay, so China. Mm -hmm. With the similar geographical conditions, the city having the similar geographical conditions. Yeah, so we have, were in contact with people from, from the UK and from uh, Denmark. Um, so I think so. I think for for Europe, well, let's say most European um, countries are not that different in the mobility behavior. So I think Scandinavia is maybe a little bit different, and also if you, I think there's more of a difference between rural and urban areas. But for example, I would say Berlin is probably not so different from Paris or London, but. Berlin to rural Germany or Paris to rural France. That's the bigger difference. Sure. The, um, for us, we have a, a we have a network from a previous project. Uh, we, uh, we we had a project under Horizon 2020 that finished two years ago, that explored these types of issues um, across six different countries. So we were able we had an opportunity to compare results in Ireland, Spain, uh, Slovenia. Norway and Greece. 
so we had a good mix of, of results and there were yeah like you there there are there are always going to be differences in countries there's, there's different kind of concerns for climate there's different levels of uh, understanding of climate change so um yeah there is there's a network from our research um that 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 we can tap into which is which is great um great <clears throat> So thank you to all of you and, uh, for your presentation and your time. And uh, thank you. If there's no more question, we will end uh, the session now. Thank you. And, uh, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.